Going through a separation is very difficult because you have all of these financial decisions to make while also trying to deal with the emotional trauma that comes with a breakup. And as humans, we tend to make very poor financial decisions when we're emotional, decisions which can come back and haunt us later in life. Today, I wanna to take some of the emotion out of it and get you financially back on track because if you have a win with your finance, it's gonna alleviate some of the stress and some of the anxiety and free up that mental space to better allow you to deal with the emotional side. It's very hard to feel confident and move on to bigger, better things if you don't have a steady source of income, if you can't pay your bills on time, if you've got no money to go out and do anything. So let's fix this. By following these steps, I'm confident that you will take back some control in your life. You're gonna start to feel like a new person, you're gonna start to go out and seek those adventures and find the silver lining that inevitably comes with every breakup. But just as a word of caution, everyone's situation is a little bit different, so this may not specifically apply to you. I would suggest you go and get independent advice from a solicitor and a financial planner before doing anything. So the first thing you need to do is get yourself some income because income or money creates independence. If you're already working, then this step is easy. Simply keep doing what you're doing, but just make sure that the money is going into an account that only you can access. There may be some need to contribute to some joint expenses, but we'll touch on this a little bit more later. If you aren't working and you don't have a steady source of income, then this makes things a little bit trickier. You may be entitled to some spousal maintenance or child support from your ex. There may also be some government payments you may be entitled to, such as the parenting payment and family tax benefit. You should contact Centrelink about your potential entitlements as a priority. Just be aware though that these payments may not start coming through immediately and they're probably not gonna be enough to give you that financial independence that you need to move forward and rebuild a new, better life. Ideally, you need to get yourself your own source of income, and the best way to do this is to get yourself a job. And yes, if you're the primary carer of children, well, this is gonna be very difficult, but it is also very difficult to have no money or rely on an ex in order to fund your living expenses. That to me is harder in the long run. Everyone on this planet should have access to a comfortable, safe and secure living arrangements. And unfortunately, in the event of separation, sometimes this isn't the case. And sometimes you need to go out there and find yourself some new arrangements. If you and your ex can coexist under the same roof, well then it's definitely possible to be legally separated, but still live together. And if you ask a lawyer, they will often tell you that this is the best way forward because it means that you can better protect your interests. By staying in the house together, you can better formalize your separation agreement. So for example, who's gonna pay the mortgage? I've seen it on occasions where one person moves out, one person stays in the house. The person that moves out wants compensation or rent from the person staying in the house. They don't agree because it's their home and ultimately, it closes down some of the lines of communication and makes things harder in the long run. But there are times where it's not practical to remain living under the same roof, particularly in instances of domestic violence. In this case, you need to get yourself and your children out of the house as soon as possible and the financial stuff will work itself out later. Just be aware though that if you do take the children with you, you should apply to the court for a consent for temporary custody of the children just to avoid any kidnapping accusations. In the short term, do not buy a new house, even if you have the means to do it. At this stage, it's a transition phase and you shouldn't be making big financial decisions. Instead, go out, if you need to move out of the house, go and find yourself somewhere to rent. You can also consider moving in with friends or family if this is an option for you. It's probably gonna be a very short-term option because you don't wanna overstay your welcome. If you are renting a place, just try and spend as little as possible because particularly at this stage in your life, cash flow is very important because the more cash flow you have, the more options you're gonna have. So if it means that in the short term, you're living in suboptimal arrangements, 
well then that's okay because it's short-term pain for long-term gain. Now that you have an income and a comfortable but short-term living arrangement, it's time to get into the nitty gritty and sort out the finer details that come with a separation. Start by agreeing on and writing down your date of separation. Now this date is gonna be important for two reasons. Firstly, you can't get a divorce until a year after this date. And secondly, when it comes to property settlement, there can be time limits which apply and they refer back to your date of separation. Next, you need to go on social media and delete all of the photos that you have together. No, I'm just joking. Next, you need to secure your privacy and your personal information. So what you need to do is you need to go through and change the passwords and pins for all of your important accounts. So things like your banking, your email accounts, your cloud accounts, and the like. You're also gonna to wanna to make sure that you have copies or the original of all your important documentation. Now this can include marriage certificate, birth certificate, passport, bank and super statements, insurance policies, tax records, car registration, bank accounts, credit card or store card statements, loan statements, utility bills, property documents, superannuation account statements, investment statements, and government benefit documents. You can also start to close out joint accounts, particularly if they give the other person access to credit. You don't want your ex taking out additional debt, which you're jointly liable for. So this means closing out things like credit cards, store accounts, lines of credit, that type of thing. Also, if you have money in redraw, I'll call up your bank and ask them to put a freeze on that so it can't be accessed without joint signatory. It may be practical to retain a single joint account to cover the ongoing joint expenses while you're working this all out. So that could be things like mortgage repayments, home insurance, uh, children's expenses, things like that. But you need to agree upon what expenses come out of the joint account and how much you're both going to put into the joint account. Any individual expense at this stage should be funded from the individual accounts. Just as a word of caution, if you close down or before closing down any accounts or credit cards, just make sure that there are no direct debits coming out of that. And if there are, have them redirected. You don't wanna be in a position where you accidentally start missing payments, which could impact your credit rating, which could impact your ability to borrow money moving forward. With all of these changes going on, it's also a good idea to stay ahead financially by setting yourself a new budget. This is going to make sure that you stay on top of all your financial obligations. Now, if you like a good Excel spreadsheet for a budget, I do have a free one to download on my website. It's called Wealth Tracker, and I'll put a link in the description below. Your property is essentially any asset that you hold. So this could include house, cars, superannuation, cash, shares, uh, personal assets. And as soon as you've agreed on a date of separation, you can start to work towards separating your assets. You don't need to wait to be divorced. The ideal scenario is that you agree on a fair and equitable property settlement with your ex without going to court. Court is going to be costly, timely, and at the end of the day, there's often no winner at the end of it. To divide your property, you generally follow a four-step process, which is the same process that's followed by the courts. And I like to think of it a bit like a cake. Step one is to identify and value. Or put another way, what is the size of the cake? So you need to make a list of all of your assets and write down a value for each asset. Step two is to consider your contributions or who made the cake. So you need to consider both direct contributions, so that's things like actually putting physical money in, and indirect contributions, which is things like the work done as an unpaid stay-at-home parent. Step three is to make further adjustments or think about what can impact the cake in the future. So we already talked about working out the split from your contributions, but there are further adjustments which can be made. So for instance, what is your future earning capacity? Who's gonna look after the children in the future? Those kinds of things can also impact the split of assets. And finally, step four is to ensure that it is just and equitable. Or in other words, did you both get a fair slice of the cake? Just remember, this is not about getting back at your ex. This process you need to go through so you can move on to bigger and better things in your life. 
and sometimes it's worthwhile conceding small items in the short term to have a long-term win. So for example, if your ex thinks that the couch is worth $1,000 and you only think it's worth 500, well, maybe just put it down as $500 to keep things rolling. Now that's not to say that you should concede on every item. What I am saying is just pick your battles. Once you believe that you've come to a fair and amicable agreement, well then it's good to get independent legal advice just to make sure that you're on solid ground. Now if you can't go through this process together because you're just not agreeing, well then you can get legal counsel to assist you or you can also get a mediator to help you through this process. Once you've come to an agreement, I would suggest applying for a consent order. This is a written agreement that is approved by the court. You don't legally have to have a consent order. You can have a written or informal agreement that is not approved by the court but it does give you greater certainty moving forward. A separation is one of those events that deem it necessary to make sure that your estate plan has been updated. And there's a few steps to this. Firstly, you wanna update your will to ensure that your estate is passed on to the preferred beneficiaries if you were to pass away. Now, the rules vary between states, but generally without a divorce order, your ex may still inherit your estate. In addition to the will, you may need to update your power of attorney and power of guardianship. If you don't have these documents, it might be worthwhile considering them. You also need to update your beneficiaries under your superannuation and insurance policies. Now, when it comes to superannuation, a divorce does deem an existing nomination invalid, even if it's a binding nomination. However, if you're separated, but not yet divorced, then under superannuation law, your ex can still be considered a dependent. So it's best to get these nominations updated as soon as you can. Just be aware that any property owned jointly doesn't form part of your estate. It automatically reverts to the surviving person under the rule of survivorship. Now this can mean that if you were to pass away and you have property jointly with your ex, well your ex is gonna get your share of the property. You can avoid this by changing the ownership from joint tenants to tenants in common. And you can do this by going to, talking to the land titles office and talking to your lender. Alternatively, you can also get your lawyer to assist. Now comes the exciting step. This is where you can reflect on your own personal and financial ambitions and set the wheels in motion to rebuild a new life. At this point, I would strongly suggest that you put together a financial plan which outlines your goals and puts together a strategy in order to help get you there. And if you're not comfortable doing this by yourself, you can always talk to a financial planner to assist you. But just remember, failure to plan is a plan to fail. One suggestion I will make when putting together your plan is to think about what financial freedom means to you. Or in other words, if you didn't have to work for money, what would your life look like? This long-term outlook can really dictate the steps that you take in the short term. But that's it for me today, guys. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope this really helped you through your process. And if it did, please give the video a thumbs up and I will see you guys in the next one.